For many people in the LGBTQ plus community, coming out is a key and formative moment in their lives. A defining moment in which they reveal an intimate aspect of their identity, not only for the people in their lives, but also for themselves. In other words, it's kind of a big deal. So it makes sense that coming out stories are so often part and parcel for queer characters in media, to the point of becoming a trope especially in media that features young queer people. In most media that centers or features teenagers, some version of the coming-of-age narrative figures into the development of these characters. Coming-of-age narratives center a character's development into maturity and adulthood, which usually include issues regarding sex and sexuality. For non-queer characters, these sorts of issues are rife with conflict and make for engaging stories that are part of the coming-of-age norms in most contemporary contexts. For queer characters, however, issues of sex and sexuality are tied to their respective sexual identities, which are considered at best outside the norm and, at worst, deviant. So oftentimes, in order for queer characters to come of age, they must also, to some degree, come out both to other characters and to the audiences watching them on the other side of the screen, a process which can present its own set of conflicts which can prove engaging for audiences. Thus, we have a reason as to why coming out stories are so common in media that features queer characters. As a gay man, I enjoy watching queer stories in media. I like to see myself reflected on the TV. So I actively seek these types of stories out, and I'm glad that there's an increasing number of queer stories being told in film, on television, and in new media. So all that to say, I was looking forward to Love, Victor. I'll admit now to not having watched Love, Simon yet, but I was excited by the prospect of a show focused on the experiences of a Latinx protagonist dealing with coming out because I can relate. So I'm sad to report that I didn't fall in love with Love, Victor, and I'm here to talk a bit about why I think it's a disappointing coming out story. Love, Victor operates as a pseudo-sequel slash spin-off of the 2018 film Love, Simon. The 10-episode first season centers around the titular Victor Salazar, whose family has moved from Texas to Atlanta. This move brings Victor and his sister Pilar to the same school where Love, Simon took place. Victor quickly reveals to the audience that he is struggling with his sexual identity via voiceovers, which are later revealed to be DMs Victor sends to Simon. This happens after the school's vice principal recounts some major plot points of Love, Simon in the show's opening moments, which inspires Victor to get in touch with Simon for advice. The rest of the season deals with Victor's struggle in coming to terms with his sexual identity while navigating his troubled home life, his new school, and an ill-fated romantic relationship with one of the most popular girls in school, Mia Brooks. While I found the show to be very digestible, ultimately, I was left feeling unsatisfied by the show, which I attribute mainly to the show's unwillingness to develop Victor as a character beyond his struggle with sexual identity. But before I delve too deeply into the reasons why I didn't connect with Love, Victor, let me start with some positives. There's only really one thing that kept me watching through the season's 10 episodes, and that's the show's cast and their respective performances. Even though the show does center Victor, played proficiently by Michael Cimino, the show's energy really radiates from the ensemble. Victor's parents, played by Ana Ortiz and James Martinez, neither of which are strangers to television coming out stories, by the way give modulated and believable performances, particularly as their storyline takes a dramatic turn. Isabel Ferreira serves moody teen realness with her honest and funny performance as Pilar. Anthony Terpels' Felix had the potential to be grating, but I think he balances the character's collection of quirks with a knowing sadness that make the character charming and sympathetic. Mason Gooding's Andrew, the closest thing this show has to an antagonist, is charming, but he's not given nearly enough to do. And the same can be said for George Sears' Benji, who does his best with the material. The show's standouts to me, however, were Rachel Hilson and B.B. Wood as Mia and Lake, respectively. The best friend duo has an immediate chemistry, with Wood's sassy, jokey Lake contrasting well with Hilson's more laid-back and thoughtful Mia. I also think the show's well-paced. The episodes run between 25 and 30 minutes, 
and this means that the show bounces back and forth between the character storylines enough that scenes don't ever feel like they last too long, and I never felt myself becoming bored or tired by the show. And that's just about all I liked about the show, which leads me to... My issues with the show really stem from frustration. Love Victor serves its audience complex issues, but undercooked resolutions. The show signals toward complications that a questioning Latino teen from a conservative religious and lower middle class family might face, but it never really treads into those areas. Instead, Love Victor is content serving up a milk toast romantic drama with a flat lead character who doesn't face any consequences for his actions. All of the potentially engaging conflict instead serves as set dressing that the show designates as potential dangers of coming out as gay, rather than the real complex issues that they are. Issues that could change the dynamic of Victor's life if and when he chooses to reveal that he is gay. This may sound harsh, but I think y'all will get a better sense of how I arrived at this conclusion if we break down the aspects of the show that I found most frustrating. Let's start with the concept of the show. At its core, Love, Victor is a coming out story. This narrative trope makes sense for a show about teenagers who are typically in the process of forming their own identities. There's nothing inherently problematic about the coming out story as a narrative trope, but for Love, Victor's titular character, the coming out story is his only story, which makes Victor's narrative throughout the season incredibly linear meaning that there's only one real goal for this character, to say the words I'm gay out loud to the various people in his life. And that's literally how the first season of the show ends. This ending isn't satisfying as a viewer because viewers are already privy to this revelation, so it doesn't work as a shocking cliffhanger the show wants us to believe that it is. And let me rant here just a little bit about this I'm gay cliffhanger because it just kind of happened and we're not shown any reactions to this revelation aside from Victor's in that moment because it happens in this really tight close up and then it cuts to black. But he's already come out to four other characters at this point, arguably four characters whose reactions might be greater cause for concern and the show really hasn't done a good job of showing the audience how his family might react to this news except for a couple of throwaway lines from his dad about like how he hopes his son's not gay and the moment where they pretend to be Elsa frolicking in the living room. For a big climactic moment, I was just left feeling like okay, he's gonna be fine. He's, his family seems chill. Like his sister is like this big Billie Eilish stand with a bunch of piercings. If anything, she's queerer than Victor and his parents are both kind of a mess and they're going through a divorce, but they seem understanding enough. Uh, okay, rant over. So because the viewer knows that the narrative arc of the character can only develop so far before the coming out takes place, Victor's coming out has to happen for the show to progress. I understand that the end of the season isn't the end point of Victor's story, or at least it isn't meant to be. Whether the show is picked up for more episodes isn't a given, although its early success suggests that the show will continue. So I can understand why the creators behind the show might want to slow down the pace of this narrative, which would be fine if the coming out narrative were only one aspect of Victor's development as a character. But it isn't, which leads me to my next point. Victor is essentially a flat character. Looking at his character arc over the course of the season, he doesn't really grow. His character is built entirely around his struggle with coming out, and we just kind of watch him verbalize what he already kind of knows at the start of the season, which is that he isn't heterosexual. Although the show's writers do give him personality traits, like making him a talented basketball player, or having a close relationship with his mom, or being part of a religious family, they don't do anything with these aspects of this character. Like, instead of exploring how Victor might have to navigate within the traditionally masculine and heterosexual spaces of organized team sports while coming to terms with his sexual identity, the show instead just alludes to why this might be a problem with a mildly homophobic joke in the locker room and hey you like what you see that's it his becoming part of the team never figures into his development as a character the show also indicates that victor's joining the team is disrupting the social status quo knocking andrew from his pedestal as the team's best player which i would have assumed would have been 
a point of conflict between these two characters. But that never really happens. Mostly because Victor's joining the basketball team is a dead-end plot point that barely figures into the overall narrative of the season. The only conflict that really arises from him joining the team stems from the high cost of joining the team, a problem which is then immediately resolved when he gets a job at the local coffee shop, which puts him in close quarters with Benji, which is in service to the coming out story. The same can be said for the fact that Victor comes from a religious family. The show's first episode makes a point to tell the audience that this is a family that attends church regularly. But the audience never sees the family attend church at any point during the first season. And the show never details the ways in which religion figures into Victor's life. The show tells us that this is an aspect of the family's life worth considering especially in light of Victor's sexual identity, but Victor never really expresses any opinion about his religion, and we don't see him engage in any religious practices like praying, and it doesn't seem to factor into his decision about coming out as gay, save for the vague threat that his family might not accept him because of their beliefs. These aspects of Victor's character that are introduced could have been explored to give the audience a more complete portrait of Victor, but instead, the show's writers and producers laser focus on just one aspect of this character, so much so that their main character ends up flat and devoid of any sort of personality. Like, even when he jokes around, it comes off as awkward because we, the audience, aren't really sure if Victor's funny. Is he funny? Does he joke? Does he like anything besides Benji? Another side rant? The only thing that shows the audience that Victor is gay is his attraction to Benji. The show doesn't indicate that Victor has or has had any homosexual attraction beyond Benji. They don't even give him a celebrity crush. Hell, they could have even given him a misguided crush on Simon, considering the intimacy of their DMs. Exacerbating my frustration with Victor's flatness is the sense that the show wants us to root for Victor at all times meaning that he is pretty much always positioned in a positive light, even when he makes questionable decisions, and that he never faces any consequences for said decisions. This happens throughout the season, but the episode I think exemplifies this best is episode 7, What Happens in Willacoochee. <laughs> Willacoochee. In this episode, the espresso machine at the coffee shop where Benji and Victor work breaks down, and their boss tasks them with getting the machine fixed by driving it to a repairman a couple hours away. This happens on the same day that Victor has agreed to attend an important party at Mia's house and to meet Mia's father for the first time. Victor and Benji's boss tells them that if the repair goes into the next day, that they should rent a hotel room and pick the machine up the next day. And let's just ignore the fact that these are two literal children being asked to do this. Like, are Victor and Benji's parents just okay with this? I'm, I'm so confused. Victor then receives the call that the machine is ready, but tempted by the idea of spending the night alone with Benji, Victor lies about the machine being ready. So not only does Victor flake out on Mia, but he also lies to Benji and his boss about the espresso machine and knowingly manipulates the circumstances in order to get closer to Benji. Victor ends up kissing Benji in the hotel room, after which a rightfully freaked out Benji decides to transfer to a different coffee shop to distance himself from Victor. In this episode, Victor consciously makes decisions to deceive people who are close to him, which, in terms of story and character development, is fine. Characters should be allowed to be flawed and make bad decisions. However, because the show wants us to root for Victor, he doesn't really face any consequences for his decisions or really learn anything from them. Mia is quick to forgive him, so he doesn't face any consequences in that relationship. And Benji essentially removes himself from the narrative so that Victor doesn't really have to deal with, at minimum, an awkward aftermath of having to continue working with Benji, or worse, any fallout from making physical advances on his coworker while on the clock. In fact, instead of having to deal with the fallout of disappointing his girlfriend and kissing his crush slash coworker in the next episode, the show instead sends Victor off to New York to visit Simon and Bram, where he gets some it gets better platitudes and a big queer group hug to make him feel better about himself. In examining the way the show's creative team positions Victor, 
I get the sense that there's a sort of tension between the kind of show the creatives want to make and the kind of show they think they have the responsibility to make. On the one hand, they want to make a traditional teen drama, rife with the kind of interpersonal conflict that keeps audiences coming back episode to episode. And on the other hand, they want to create a sort of gentle, supportive coming out story that might prove encouraging to an audience who might also be struggling with their own sexual identities. And I think these goals are at odds because the show's creatives are so committed to making sure Victor's coming out story is a positive one that they allow him to emerge unscathed from every conflict he faces. And in doing so, the show has to concede to Victor's needs in ways that are unsatisfying narratively and, in my opinion, a bit too optimistic. And this is an issue that has faced creators making queer stories throughout the history of queer media. In the year 2000, queer scholar Michael Bronsky addressed the limitations of coming out narratives in media in his article Positive Images and the Coming Out Film. In this article, he notes the inherently political nature of coming out films by queer filmmakers and how this type of film is often tasked not only with telling a coherent narrative, but also with presenting positive representations of queerness on screen, which in turn poses limitations on how the filmmakers tell these stories and on the types of stories that can be told. As a general rule, Bronsky writes, nearly all coming out films posit a happy ending. Homophobia, usually with family or friends, presents some complications, but these are generally simplified and overcome with goodwill and even better intentions. While most gay and liberal viewers can see the importance of this, coming out should be presented as a positive and healthy action. The irony is that this simplistic look at the world actually reduces the importance and even the imperative of the action of coming out. It also misjudges the harshness of homophobia in the world. All too often, even when films acknowledge real problems caused by homophobia in the world, they create a fantasy world in which coming out has only minor negative consequences. The limitations that Bronsky noted in the coming out films of decades past mirror the limitations I see in the first season of Love, Victor. I can only speculate as to why these creative decisions may have been made by the show's creative team, but ultimately what matters is the end product. And I absolutely see the value in having a show that centers a character of color's coming out story that is targeted at a teen audience, some of which may be facing similar struggles as Victor. But for a show that purports to center a queer experience? Ultimately, I'm disappointed that the show is content with merely alluding to the complexities of queer lives, rather than engaging with these complexities head on. But I don't want to go out on a negative note, so now let me recommend two shows that I feel were more successful in the way they presented their respective queer stories. Netflix's One Day at a Time and Disney Plus's Diary of a Future President, both of which, like La Victor, center Latinx families and feature teenage characters grappling with their sexual identities. Now, if you haven't seen the first season of either of these shows, warning, big picture spoilers, uh, go watch them if you haven't already and you don't want to be spoiled. One of the major narrative threads that weaves through the first season of One Day at a Time is Elena's coming out story. Elena is a teenage daughter of the show's protagonist, Penelope. And although her main storyline throughout the season centers her coming out, the show takes the time to flesh out her character by showing the audience various facets of her personality that extend beyond her queerness. She's an environmentalist. She's a feminist. She enjoys sci-fi and horror. She's engaged in politics. The show also takes care to demonstrate how these facets of her personality affect her dynamic within the family, as her worldview is often at odds with her more conservative-leaning mother and grandmother. In terms of her coming out story, I like how it plays out over the course of the entire season, and how the show portrays coming out not as this big keystone moment, but rather as a constant repeating process by having Elena come out to her family one by one at different points throughout the season, and how each family member reacts differently to Elena's truth. I also thought it was really clever how Elena's coming out story ran in parallel with the plotline about her quincess which is another type of coming out that symbolizes the transition from childhood into womanhood, creating this sort of thematic bond between her coming out and her coming of age ceremony. 
And although this is a traditional half-hour multicam sitcom, where most of the characters' conflicts end up resolved, for the most part, by the end of any given episode, Elena's coming out does lead to some unresolved tensions within her family at the end of the season, which better reflects the challenges that face a significant portion of young people who come out only to face rejection or disappointment from their families. Unlike Elena's coming out story on One Day at a Time, Bobby's story on Disney Plus's Diary of a Future President is more of a questioning story, where Bobby doesn't come out at the end of the season, but instead we see him arrive at a realization about his own sexual identity. As with Victor, Bobby faces external conflicts which arise due to his insecurities regarding his sexual identity, which is mainly portrayed as an internal conflict. But the show smartly ties this internal conflict to Bobby's character traits. Bobby is portrayed as a sort of aloof older brother type, seemingly unbothered by the complexities of life, which is in stark contrast to his more type A sister. However, the audience is privy to the struggle he is facing regarding his sexual identity, so we know that his it's chill vibe is at time a front for sadness and confusion that lies underneath. His aloofness also makes the moments where he expresses frustration or joy much more poignant. The show also presents Bobby with a more nuanced portrayal of queer life when he visits Camila, a paralegal at his mom's law firm and a lesbian in a long-term relationship who has not come out to her family. Camila is the only character who has a sense that Bobby might be queer, and initially she tries to coax Bobby toward coming out. But after realizing her hypocrisy with a bit of help from her girlfriend, Camila reflects on her situation and voices her realization that coming out is a process that's different for everyone. This reassures Bobby and prompts him to make some decisions that are best for himself and for those in his life. Overall, I thought Bobby's was a sweet and realistic portrayal of a young person going through the process of questioning their sexual identity while not fully sanding down the edges of what it means to be queer in this moment. So yeah, go check out these shows if you haven't already. And check out Love, Victor too. I do want to see more. It has its teen drama charms. Very ABC Family tease. You know, at least enough to keep me watching through the entire first season. And, you know, bothered enough to make a whole video about it. Um, and if you have other good recommendations for queer coming out stories, drop them in the comments. I want to know what you think. Did you hate Love, Victor more than I did? Did you love it more than I did? Do you agree with me? Do you think I'm off my rocker? Uh, yeah, let me know. Anyway, peace out, everybody. Love, Wednesday.